right, welcome to the Rowdy uh, interview. Buzz Cutler here with the spotter for the number two Miller Lite Dodge, Joey Meyer. Thanks for being here, I appreciate your mm, time. Thanks for having us. It's Absolutely, I, s I specifically wanted to talk to you, talk to a spotter after Talladega, because mm -hmm. we had Tab Boyd in here, the spotter for Juan Pablo Montoya yep. after Daytona. Mm -hmm. Fascinating conversation. So from Daytona, when you guys were just sort of figuring out this two-car draft, to Talladega, what was the evolution for you as a spotter? What changed from Daytona to Talladega? At Talladega, the biggest thing that we did was communication. The teams back at the shop worked heavily on cooling, which NASCAR took a little bit away from us at Daytona, and we come back even better at Talladega. But the biggest thing from a spotter-driver combination was the communication level. All right, now we did the pod, uh, we, we, we use different names for it. Uh, I refer to the packs, the two car groups as pods. It's something simple, short, to the point that when I say it on the radio, he knew exactly what I was talking about. So as we develop the pod racing, now we know what the driver wants to hear. If he's behind, uh, he can't see going forward. If the guy's in front, he can't see what's behind. So it was the communication that really evolved with the drivers wanting to or not wanting to change frequencies with other drivers coming to you and saying, hey, I'm gonna be on your frequency. All right, uh, at Daytona, when the driver came over to your frequency, it was still the spotters, he was on the radio 90% of the time. The biggest difference at Talladega was when the driver came to your frequency, the spotter was off the air almost totally. The driver leading the pod was one doing all the talking. And so we didn't see that very much at Daytona. Interesting. Now. I heard a quote from David Reagan after the race saying he was on his own channel mm -hmm. at Talladega for maybe like one lap. Right. And so we, he was hearing voices he had never heard before. Right. Were, so were you in c communication with Brad, like when Brad and Kurt were working together? Yes. Were you in communication with them or was Kurt's spotter or a combination of the no, two? No, there, there was two mentalities of it. The one mentality was uh, I'm going to switch to every other driver. The second mentality is, I'm gonna accept any driver that comes to us, and that was more Brad and Kurt's mentality. So we actually never changed frequencies, but we had drivers come to our frequency, and that was the biggest difference. Okay, so when you have other drivers on there, on your yeah. listening in, did you feel like you had to adapt your style because you and Brad might have a specific vocabulary yeah. that works for you, but you might use terms that Kurt isn't used to hearing. So yeah. did you, were you conscious of that at all? Well, when I found out we had a, the crew chief had to approve who you gave your frequency to, to other drivers. I did my best to find out who those drivers were. And what I did is I actually went to their spotter before the race and I said, hey, if you guys switch over to our frequency, what do you want to hear? What does your driver want to hear? Do you normally, how do you do it? What do you, you know, those are the kind of things that I tried to go out of my way just to see how their driver liked it. And so when he came over to our frequency, it wasn't like our first time doing it, even though it may have been. Right, and I assume when a driver, like let's just say Kurt Busch came over to your frequency, his spotter came as well. Well, it, the, the spotter did not, because the spotter doesn't change frequencies. Just, Ever. just right, just gotcha. the driver does. What he might do is set up his radios where he can scan another driver. But see, he needs to be on his frequency so that the crew chief can still talk to him. So you still have that connection that can never be broken. What he will do and what we'll do on the spotter stand for Talladega, um, when a driver switches frequencies and goes over, the spotters get together and they stand. And if I need something from you know Chris Osborne who spots for Kurt, he'll tap me or I'll tap him. But the link between the crew chief and the spotter is never really broken. Understood. I guess the other thing that's, that's really different spotting with these two-car drafts is now you're spotting a car that's twice as long yes. as what you're used to spotting. Right. So did that throw you off? No, it, 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 to throw it off, we got to practice it at Daytona for sure. But the interesting thing is when you spot a single car and the driver's in front of somebody, you know he can see forward. So there's certain information going forward you don't give him. Well, this is the complete opposite. You have to give him both what's in front for the guy pushing and what's behind for the guy pulling. Uh -huh. So you spotted twice because it was like he was totally blind. You know, even though it was a single car, you were looking out in front and behind, which is kind of unusual. Right, because one guy has a 180 degree view forward, the other yeah. guy has 180 degree view right. backward, but it's not the same guy. No, so if you were if you were doing the spotting and you're moving through traffic, uh, like you say, the train is twice as long now. So even though your front car may have cleared traffic or to move lanes, you wouldn't say clear high or low until the second guy was able to do that maneuver as well. Did you ever have an instance where the front guy cleared 
but by the time the back guy cleared, they were in traffic in front again and couldn't couldn't clear lower high. Well, that's where the radio communication was extremely important with the two drivers talking to each other, and it worked out better if the two drivers could talk. If I was doing all the talking and the guy pushing didn't get a big enough picture or a clear enough picture, what he would do is he would just, you know, we say dump or let the first guy go and, and let him maneuver and the second car would maneuver and then we'd just get back up to each other after we cleared that pack. But if you, the two drivers were talking, he could give a better indication of how fast or how quickly he was gonna move and change lanes. All right, so I guess this is gonna continue to evolve. You've got uh, the Firecracker, you've got mm -hmm. another race at Talladega. So did you guys have like a post-mortem after the fact and say, <laughs> this worked, this didn't work, what's the next step in this evolution from a spotter's perspective? Yeah, one of the things that Brad uh, and myself do after every race is we go back and we watch the video from TV. And specifically at this race, we had the convenience of uh, unfortunately getting involved in an incident that kept us out of the contention for the win. So when we were back in the back still running with Brian Vickers and those two were talking, Brad took on a new, uh, he elevated his uh, mentality on what he wanted. Uh, we had talked about it before the race and then had a change of heart after the race to a different direction. So I think we'll go back to, uh, to Daytona in July with a little different direction of our radio communication. Excellent. All right. Joey Meyer, the spotter for the number two Miller Lite Dodge of Penske Racing. Brad Keselowski, of course, is the driver. Thank you for your time. Mm. This this is this spotting stuff, especially these two car drafts, man. This is fascinating stuff. It's only begun uh, and there's no end to it. It can keep just getting better and better and it'd be more exciting for the fans for sure. All right. We're going to have more with Joey on a separate video. So uh, make sure you check back on a regular basis. Rowdy.com. Say it like it is. Say what like it is. Robbie.com.